we're joined by historian and author Walter L. Hickson. He is the author of the 2021 book, Architects of Repression, How Israel and Its Lobby Put Racism, Violence, and Injustice at the Center of U.S. Middle East Policy. We're going to uh, spend time with Walter going through some of the most important questions and drilling down on the question of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee uh, treatment in his book. But first, let's just start off getting a bit of background on Walter. So Walter, explain a little bit about who you are and how you've come uh, through your career to write what I think is one of the definitive books on the Israel lobby in the United States. Well, thank you, Grant. Yeah, I didn't begin focused on Israel in the Middle East. I was um, trained as a Cold War historian and uh, actually spent um, several months living in Russia before the fall, right at the time of the fall of the uh, USSR. And so most of my early career was focused on the history of the Cold War. And I gained a lot of expertise in that. And the, the Middle East was really peripheral in uh, my vision. Later in my career, I looked more deeply into it and realized that uh, really I had uh, imbibed a lot of the stereotypes um, and misperceptions about the so-called Middle East conflict as a sort of ancient enmities type of conflict, a religious type of conflict, um, you know, endless and complex. And it's really none of those things. It's uh, a much more basic uh, conflict, not that difficult to understand and uh, clear uh, perceptions of justice and injustice in the conflict. So I was captivated by it, uh, visited uh, Jerusalem and, and Israel and the occupied territories, and that was eye-opening. Uh, in 2013. And from that point on, I was uh, really uh, very intensely engaged in researching uh, this particular subject. So you've written, uh, again, quite a number of histories, including the myth of American diplomacy, national identity and U.S. foreign policy. That was Yale University Press in 2008. You've written American foreign relations, a new diplomatic his history, Rutledge 2015. Um, the focus of those books, when you say you, you kind of followed the, the narrative, uh, what was it about uh, looking at history that would cause any historian to maybe kind of just accept the, the dominant narrative? Well, I, I think we're learning really more and more, even in present day politics and the role of the internet how important discourse is or basic uh, perceptions, uh, frameworks, the way issues uh, and politics are framed and discussed um, really carries tremendous weight with masses of people. Um, foreign policy, it's always been true that Americans, for example, are, are much more inclined to know more about their domestic uh, economic situation or domestic economic issues and far less about the world and about foreign policy. So this has always been true. And uh, so in Myth of American Diplomacy, I looked at the, the myths and misperceptions and uh, basically American exceptionalism, the, the view that the United States was uh, destined and chosen to lead the world. And I looked at and continue, continued another work to explore the relationship between uh, that perception and US uh, aggression and militarism overseas. But the same holds true of the Middle East. There are a lot of uh, the discourse and the misperceptions about the uh, Palestine issue uh, have played a, a persistent and uh, substantial role in how uh, Americans see that conflict. So looking at some of the main topics of architects of repression, um, I think it's, it's interesting how you start off and sort of set the scene with Trump's bankruptcy attorney, his daughter, Ivanka, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and the Adelsons, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson, 
all gathered in what looked to be from the video, a very elegant ceremony dedicating the newly relocated U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, just a, a major, major accomplishment years in the making by the lobby. So what was significant about that or so significant about that, that it, it really was the beginning discussion of this book? Well, in addition to Jerusalem being the literal center of the conflict, uh, the juxtaposition on that date in May 14th, 2018, uh, not only of the embassy dedication, which as you've indicated, uh, brought out uh, you know, well-attired, very wealthy, uh, highly elite, overwhelmingly white uh, establishment figures celebrating this uh, blatant illegal action under international law of relocating the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which had long been prescribed by the U.N. and the vast majority of nations, almost all beyond Israel and the United States and throw in the Marshall Islands. Um, so, but the juxtaposition with what was happening in Gaza, where that same day, uh, Israeli uh, troops opened fire indiscriminately, including even killing health workers, first responders, uh, during the so-called Great March of Return, in which Palestinians were making a symbolic march. So the violence against brown-skinned people who'd been denied national existence by this long decades of, of uh, history of Zionist settler expansion and aggression and Israeli regional aggression, uh, the juxtaposition, juxtaposition that very day of the celebration in Jerusalem, the clinking of the, the champagne glasses, along with this brutal violence, uh, really struck me and seemed an appropriate way to open the uh, book. Okay, and you say uh, in later portions of the book, and this this really struck me when I first read it, uh, in kind of looking at the reactions to that and other parts of the U.S. and Israel relationship, how that could even possibly happen. But you say that in terms of opposition to that sort of outrage, progressives and radicals haven't always placed or played a very productive role when it comes to understanding or confronting the Israel lobby. You're, you're pretty harshly critical of some of the luminaries and uh, recent books <laughs> about uh, US Middle East policy. T tell us about progressives and radicals that, that would normally dive headlong into looking at the role of the lobby that really haven't. Yeah, it's been a source of frustration for me, and I know, of course, it has been for you as well, that, um, that a lot of these progressive and radical voices are, have been very strong on defending uh, Palestinian rights and on the basic um, illegality and illegitimacy and injustice of the conflict, but for bizarre reasons that are difficult really to understand and very frustrating uh, to, to face, um, they deny the role of the Israel lobby, which is absolutely central to all of this. Going back to the point I discussed earlier about the role of discourse and perceptions and the way issues are framed and the way people are, um, are as a result of the way language is used and the way issues are framed, uh, taught to look at a certain issue like the Palestine issue, uh, the lobby plays a tremendously significant role in framing that language and uh, shaping the way Americans view it and, and view it wrongly, although uh, it's, uh, the situation's steadily improving. We can talk about that a little later. But uh, I think it's, um, you know, it may be as simple as these intellectuals aren't themselves fooled by the lobby, so they don't think it's very important, uh, but that doesn't mean that masses of other people are not uh, shaped by and directed by the language that the lobby puts out and the propaganda that it uh, puts out. And it, it's also just intellectual arrogance. And frankly, it's uh, a, a laziness in terms of uh, un, uh, they haven't studied the issue. So sometimes uh, some progressives and radicals have made the claim, oh, the lobby's not important. Mm -hmm. It's more 
corporations, which doesn't make much sense. Um, and they haven't looked into the matter. So the yeah. people who have looked into the matter, uh, we have, uh, of course, famously, um, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt looked into the matter and wrote basically a, a really straightforward book that was uh, vilified and uh, demonized and even labeled anti-Semitic, which of course is a tactic the lobby has resorted to more and more in recent years to try to discredit uh, straightforward and, and truthful information. But mm -hmm. it was a very solid book uh, and yet became massively controversial for no good reason in part because um, of these um, progressives who won't acknowledge the significance and centrality of the Israel lobby. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I agree. It is frustrating. And I think there are also some financial perils to not just focusing on sort of acceptable outcomes, which nobody can defend, such as the Palestinian situation. But uh, let's get into the book specifically. Uh, what time period does this book cover and why? And you've written another book on the lobby uh, that Cambridge University Press published uh, in what, 2019, Israel's Armor, the Israel Lobby and the First Generation of the Palestine Conflict. So how do these two books work together? Where does one pick up and where does the other uh, pick up? Yeah, I um, when I did get into uh, focusing on the Middle East and took my uh, trip to do um, for a few weeks in the in Israel and the occupied territories, when I came back, I began look, working on the study that became Israel's Armor. It's, it's a more formal academic book uh, published with Cambridge and it um, ends with the 1967 war and the establishment of the occupation in 1968. So I wanted to take the story further to the present, but I wanted to do it all in one volume with um, Architects of Repression and to be more, um, more outwardly, openly critical of this injustice that is uh, just apparent and fact-driven in this history. Um, so I went back, but I spent less time on the early period. Um, Architects of Repression really picks up with World War II. To me, while you can certainly argue that the Israel lobby uh, goes way back to the World War I period and even to the uh, beginning of the Zionist movement at the, at the turn of the century, and that's, that's legitimate to argue that, and certainly there was an active Zionist movement um, and in, the influence in the Congress was apparent as early as World War I. But to me, the modern Israel lobby really begins with the uh, Biltmore meeting in New York, when um, the lobby really kicked off and the drive to uh, recognize a Jewish commonwealth, as it was then referenced, in the Middle East uh, took off and gained uh, growing popularity in the United States. And that's when a certain number of people, Abba Hillel Silver, Stephen Wise, although they disagreed about many things, they agreed on the need to lobby American support, rally American support for this new Jewish Commonwealth. And so I look at kind of the World War II period in 1942 as the real kickoff for the Israel lobby. And then of course, with the actual creation of Israel in 1948, it takes off. So I was able to go back and uh, the papers of Isaiah Leo Kinnan at the Center for Jewish History um, in New York or the New York Jewish Archives in New York City, Center for Jewish Histories in Cincinnati archive I also visited and exploited uh, these, uh, but especially Kinnan's papers. He was the real workhorse, uh, this former um, Canadian immigrant uh, from a Central European Jewish immigrant family, uh, trained as a journalist, but also a lawyer. And he became, uh, as you well know, the key figure in the early history of the lobby. And his papers were excellent and available in New York. And I exploited them fully in Israel's armor, but have since taken off with other sources on this book, including um, APAC uh, archives, and especially the uh, Near East Report publication of APAC. 
So let's get into that uh, a little bit. Um, you know, you use the American Israel Public Affairs Committee as a key focus, those papers you mentioned, and you frame it um, you know, sequentially by presidential administration, which is a, you know, a fairly standard thing to do in a lot of mainstream histories. But um, before getting back to that sort of central focus, you, know, you mentioned that Israel's armor was more of a standard sort of academic uh, book. It was certainly published by an academic publisher, Cambridge University Press. Uh, do you feel as though there's any sort of limitation to what you can do with a, a traditional publisher, uh, academic publisher, in terms of this topic? Absolutely. And there was pushback even in that pretty straightforward um, traditional uh, academic press. Uh, Cambridge did a nice job with the book, but um, the editor and the external um, referees, the way uh, academic book publishing operates is the manuscript will be sent out to experts in the field for their evaluation, to catch any errors, to recommend for or against publication, to discuss how the book sit, will sit with the field, the existing literature. Um, they took exception to my use of the term ethnic cleansing, which Ilan Pape had put in the title of his excellent book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which is document driven and evidence driven. Mm -hmm. And even uh, much to my surprise, uh, some of the uh, external reviewers and the editor at Cambridge um, wanted me to uh, temper use of the term settler colonialism which is really absurd because uh, settler colonialism has, has taken off as a major subfield in historical studies in the past 10 years with uh, Lorenzo Veracini and um, Shura uh, Robinson and many other scholars writing books with settler colonialism in the title. Right. But when it comes to Israel-Palestine, everything is policed. And this is something we can get into later that is very disturbing. Um, and that's not only does this whole conflict um, revolve around the repression of Palestinian rights and injustice in Palestine, it attacks the rights of Americans, including freedom of speech and uh, freedom of expression. And it's affected uh, the academy uh, very greatly. And uh, there, the lack of critical voices in the academy about Israel and Palestine for an academic such as myself, I'm now retired, but it's it's very disturbing. And I think the academy has failed. I think academic publishing has failed. I think journalism has failed. And again, this is why the lobby is so important because the dominant discourse in this country has enabled uh, the repression of more critical voices. Well, I think it is important to note that academic and expert review you know, peer review and expert review is not something that's limited, certainly, to academic press. Uh, and that, of course, Architects of Repression and your forthcoming book have both been reviewed in that way. So it, it seems as though that problem may be in the rearview mirror for upcoming generations of truly critical scholars. And I, I hope that is the case. So getting back to the structure of- Let me, let me just interject quickly, Grant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Peer review is, is really important and really helpful. And I have no problem with peer review at all. And it almost invariably makes books better. Yeah. And, and even in, in all the cases you mentioned, including Israel's armor as well, the book got better as a result of peer review. But uh, what happened with that book was that the, the dominant and misperceptions did creep in to some of the evaluation. Right, right. And then there's this expectation that the author will have to toe the line or what happens to the project if uh, the author has evidence-based disagreement with that or that right. the peer reviewer may not be <laughs> just as some of these uh, progressives and radicals we spoke about earlier don't really know enough to do a valid criticism. What happens then? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a negotiation and um, 
you end up, uh, at least I ended up, you know, you sneak a few things in really um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I wasn't going to give up on the term settler colonialism. It's too important and too central right. uh, to the analysis. So to it's suggest too that valuable, that, I mean, it, it really is one of the most valuable frameworks to yeah. have emerged. So I, I had to stick with that for my own academic integrity and, and managed to. So I'm proud of that book and it's it's fine. Uh, in that regard, and we got most of what I needed into it, but it was striking how that that whole system um, unfold, uh, that saga unfolded. So you organized a book by presidential administration. Why did you do that? Well, just um, I think it's pretty much the it's it's um, organized chronologically, essentially, and and obviously the administrations come chronologically. What's striking about it is. Um, you know, history doesn't literally repeat itself. That's a cliche that really isn't borne out. But uh, the same sorts of um, evolution uh, did occur. And that is that very often, uh, even with Truman, even with, even with Johnson to some extent, and these are some of the most uncritically pro-Israel presidents, but especially with presidents like Eisenhower, uh, like Nixon, like Carter, like Obama, presidents of, of both parties, there would often be a, uh, a you know, big talk and determination to confront Israel in the lobby and to demand some changes in this imbalanced, uh, uh, unjust situation that had been allowed to uh, occur. But when they came into office, administration after administration confronted the realities of the power of the lobby, uh, especially in Congress. And essentially, uh, they all, to one degree or another, bowed to it bowed before it. And so again, it uh, was a, a testament. I mean, is the lobby influential? It tames presidents. It directs the Congress. So it's very influential and extremely powerful. And you see this again and again with the determination of a president, a popular president like Eisenhower, a popular president like Obama, and they are utterly unable to uh, make a dent really in the power of the lobby, which only grows stronger um, when it is confronted by executive authority in, in efforts to make Israel enter into even the most basic compromises in recognition of Palestinian rights and justice in the Middle East. Okay, so tell us about the Near East report. Uh, what is the significance of it? Who publishes it? What's its role? Yeah, the Near East report was one of the more uh, one of one of the major stories of the lobby is uh, just how how successful it's been, and how smart and capable and skilled and adaptable uh, its leadership has been. Um, so you can uh, condemn the Israel lobby, and I do condemn the Israel lobby for its uh, machinations and the injustice it promotes. But there's no doubting it's it's skill. The any any uh, Near East report is an example of that. So it did a couple of things when it was created um, by Kennan and his cohorts in the late 1950s. One, it it was a uh, as you well know an important source for generating revenue, and the revenue was then diverted uh, by uh, the state of Israel and the Jewish Agency in New York purchasing copies of the Near East report, subscriptions, diverting that money to Kennan and to the domestic lobby and um, skirting uh, foreign agent registration uh, legislation that went back to the 1930s. Um, so it was extremely successful in, uh, that was called out by Fulbright in secret hearings in the early 60s, but, uh, and some changes were made, but they raised revenue for one but even more important than that, uh, the Near East report, which Kennan, with his journalism background, um, was very skillfully edited, had the appearance of straightforward news, but it was uh, very, very subtly, highly propaganda. And moreover, it was geared toward the Congress. So every member of Congress regularly received the Near East report. Uh, he began to write pro-Israel congressmen up in the Near East report. Other congressmen sought that kind of free, favorable publicity. 
with the Jewish and other communities and became more and more pro-Israel. And it was just a highly effective device for shaping um, the pro-Israeli views of the United States Congress and a, a larger foreign policy and uh, Washington wonk, but nationwide uh, community of readers and its, its readership grew uh, regularly. And so for the 50s, late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the Near East Report with the internet, it's, it's changed a, a lot and there's so many sources of information but for decades, the Near East Report, which uh, I've gone through pretty systematically mm -hmm. um, for this book, uh, had a profound influence on Congress and on creating this discourse we've been discussing of, of pro-Israeli um, propaganda in the United States. Yeah, I've, I've had the same experience of, in my case, sitting in the Library of Congress, having them bring up stacks and stacks of the Near East report and paging through them. Um, one of them even had I, Isaiah Cannon's business card tucked inside. Oh, really? Oh. Fell out as I was leaving through. But I, I do think that one of the you know, things that you can't yeah. underestimate is the distribution of the Near East report. I think uh, Cannon was bragging at one point it was going to everybody listed in who's who the Saturday Evening Post, all sorts of major magazines. And it was, again, this highly edited, expertly crafted uh, news source that was not really visible to the public, but everybody uh, on Capitol Hill was getting it. Everybody in the mainstream media was getting it. But I also think it's important to emphasize uh, the Jewish Agency for Israel was paying Isaiah Cannon quite a lot for uh, putting that newsletter out. It was the funding vehicle for him that allowed him to get money from an Israeli foreign agent and fund his operations. And I, I think without the Near East report and the quarterly payments he was getting from this foreign entity, uh, they would have been in real trouble. And of course, it allowed the uh, Senate investigation to see what was really going on and document all of that. But so just to, to move on a little bit, um, the basic question always comes up, does APAC speak for or represent everybody who's identifying religiously or culturally as Jewish? Are they like the voice of this segment of America? Well, they would like to be, but uh, they're not. And one of the most important, um, you know, stories today is the emergence of more and more uh, Jews willing to criticize Israel, which for a long time was simply taboo in American culture. Your duty as a as a good Jew was to rally behind Israel and to support Israel, and and the propaganda on that was uh, pervasive, and uh, the local. Jewish federations reinforced it. So as you well know, the lobby is sprawling and complex and, and APAC is certainly the centerpiece and, and the most powerful formal uh, disciplinary and money raising lobby. That is, it, it punishes those who uh, vote or, or talk the way they don't like them to do in Congress and it supports those who towed the line, the pro-Israel line, uh, APAC as uh, as powerful as any lobby in the United States, let alone foreign policy lobby, which is by far the most powerful in all of American history. So APAC is the centerpiece, no doubt, but um, the Conference of Presidents of American Jewish Organizations has always worked closely with APAC, these local federations, councils, um, but they do not speak for the entire Jewish community. And, and uh, from the very outset, there were uh, a substantial number of non-Zionist Jews who didn't like this idea of a Jewish commonwealth. Uh, they wanted Judaism to remain a, a great and powerful religion and not a country. And uh, the, um, some were, were strongly opposed, like the American Council on Judaism, which remains today, but it's a minority fringe and much vilified and demonized uh, group. But more and more we see um, American Jews who have traditionally been much more liberal uh, 
than many other uh, groups and, and religions in American history and culture, um, unable or unwilling to any longer uh, just look the other way while Israel engages in brutal and, and violent repression. So APAC doesn't, uh, doesn't speak for all Jews and, and some Jewish groups, um, you know, there are critical uh, groups like Americans for Peace Now, uh, J Street, there's limitations to their criticism of Israel. And then uh, on uh, further um, to the left, there are uh, Jewish groups like JVP, uh, which are highly critical, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace of, of Israeli policy and support BDS and are, uh, are fully uh, demanding change. So this is one of the most fascinating and important stories right now is the ability and the willingness of certain uh, segments of the American Jewish community to speak up and demand change. It's really important and uh, it's definitely uh, gonna, uh, something the lobby has to deal with uh, in the future. So let's circle back to that topic of settler colonialism now and what legacy do the US and Israel share when it comes to settler colonialism, colonization and what sort of explanatory power does that have? Well, it's a very important um, framework, settler colonialism. Uh, it explains a lot about Israel and yet there are unique uh, aspects uh, about Israel that, that differentiate it from other settler societies. So the United States is a settler society. Australia is a settler society. And there are many others uh, going back to ancient history and throughout history. The essence of settler colonialism is uh, the belief on the part of a more modern, developed, and usually white uh, and mostly Anglo-American people that they are superior and indeed destined to occupy a land. And in order to do so, to displace, to basically eliminate to the greatest extent possible, the indigenous population of that land. And so Australia did that with Aborigines, Americans, as I and uh, countless other people have studied, uh, did that with uh, Native Americans, in, in this country, uh, masses of people were removed from the land, continental wide scope of ethnic cleansing, of elimination of these people. And we see the legacies of this today, whether it's controversies over sports team names or many other aspects. So this is a deeply rooted historic phenomenon. The United States is a settler society Australia is a settler society. Israel is a settler society. And so what these modernist um, European Jews sought to do, and, and Ben-Gurion was very straightforward about this, uh, was to remove as many Arabs, Palestinians as possible, and to replace them with as many Jews as possible. This defines Israeli history. It defines it to this very day. It's going on at this very moment in East Jerusalem, in the settlement now over 700,000 illegal settlers in the uh, illegally occupied Palestinian territories, as well as the Golan Heights. And so uh, it really defines what Israel is and as it really defines what the United States is. And so this also contributes to the affinity between these two countries because uh, it's to be expected that the United States sort of understands Israel as a settler society that has dealt with savage people and been forced to remove them from the land uh, to make way for a superior God chosen people to occupy the land. Now, the two things that do distinguish it are one, the, uh, the history of anti-Semitism which uh, is very real and went on for centuries. Jews were vilified and subjected to pogroms in, in, uh, especially in East Central Europe. And this made the intensity of Zionist settler colonialism that much more um, intense. Uh, they were that much more determined because of the horrors that had preceded and culminated with the Nazi Holocaust. 
But the other, uh, I think this is kind of one of the most original things about my book. The other uh, aspect of this that is distinguishes Israel is the belatedness of Israeli settler colonialism. So the United States removed Indians, you know, beginning in, in you know, beginning with Columbus, but mainly in the 19th century. And Australia was settled in that same century. So this is when there was a lot less uh, heightened awareness of uh, racism. Racism was seen as scientific and normal. Some races were seen to be superior to other races. Science allegedly uh, made that the truth in those societies in the 19th century. We know better in the 20th, or we should. And certainly after World War II with the UN, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Israel came to birth precisely at the same time as this human rights discourse emerged. And this has made the challenge of justifying Zionism and Zionist oppression that much greater. And that has produced the need for a powerful and effective lobby, which they built and which has carried that uh, struggle despite the rise of human rights discourse. They've been very successful in combating it. So the U.S. and Israel both share this legacy of settler colonization, and it explains some things about the relationship. Um, did Israel's founders expect the indigenous people to peacefully acquiesce to a flood of new immigrants after World War II, or did they kind of understand, despite the propaganda, what was going to happen? Yeah, despite the propaganda, there's there's no way that the, the Zionist settlers could not have expected resistance. Um, there was a major uh, Palestinian uprising in the 1930s as uh, amid the uh, Nazi genocide, the uh, Jews began to pour from East Central Europe into uh, Palestine. So they well knew that uh, creation of a Jewish state, partition of the British Mandate of Palestine would create uh, violent resistance. People, after all, are going to fight for their homelands. Um, and this was true throughout the history of settler colonialism, whether it was Australia, the United States, or Palestine. Uh, so they, they knew there would be violence, and uh, they were well equipped with their militias and uh, with terror tactics uh, targeting the British, by uh, including those by future Israeli leaders such as Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir were, were essentially terrorists uh, against, um, against the British uh, mandate in Palestine. So they were very clear, uh, very determined uh, that there would be this Jewish commonwealth as they called it, uh, regardless of the violent repression that would be entailed in displacing Palestinians. And when they got their chance, some 750,000 were driven out in the Nakba of 1948, which enabled the founding of the state of Israel. Okay, so one of um, my favorite chapters of Architects of Repression is chapter seven. And just to kind of drill down even more, um, what what essentially was the job of the Israel lobby in APAC? Uh, what did they have to do in 2006? And what was going on in terms of Israel's war with Lebanon? Let's let's start with the first war with Lebanon in the 1980s, because as you well know, Grant, that was a turning point for the lobby too. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the war did not go well, and many Israelis uh, were uh, angry about the number of casualties that Israel suffered. And unlike the 1967 so-called Six-Day War, which was a dramatic and um, clear victory, in this case, the resistance in Lebanon was uh, significant and uh, cost, as I just said, a lot of casualties to the Israelis. Furthermore, there was criticism in the West and including it was uh, eye-opening. For example, um, uh, many American Jews began to question uh, 
their previously unquestioned support for Israel because of the violence of the first Lebanon war. So the point I want to make about that is that the lobby took all this in and APAC realized they had to up their game significantly. So uh, a lot of resources and effort were pumped into APAC. They began to be more active in uh, policing the American media and, uh, and challenging it, especially uh, public television and radio, but also mainstream journalism and to spend more in attacking politicians that they felt weren't sufficiently supportive of Israel and rewarding those that were supportive of Israel. So that really took off in the 80s and the 90s. The lobby grew stronger and stronger to the point where you ask about in 2006 with yet another war in Lebanon. And again, it doesn't go well. And by this point, Israel essentially has, uh, is losing in Lebanon and has created its own permanent opposition through its uh, regional and borderland aggression. And there's a long history of, of Israel's borderland aggression. It's hardly the uh, poor defenseless sole democracy that's besieged by all quarters. It is the aggressor in the region and uh, mounted many cross-border attacks into Jordan as well as into Syria and essentially started and wanted the 1967 uh, June war. So Israel had long been the regional aggressor and uh, Lebanon had been this particular target. The PLO was driven out in the 80s and now another war in Lebanon, but at this point, uh, Hezbollah backed by Iran, but homegrown um, resistance in Lebanon defends Lebanon from Israeli aggression and they dig into the, the hillsides and prove to be very effective and essentially uh, prevail, really, and force Israel to withdraw. And so the lobby has to deal with uh, more carnage in Lebanon, tens of thousands of people killed by Israeli militarism, and yet uh, not a success story for Israel. So that's the setting amid the uh, the war on terror that the United States has declared and is now identifying in the 2000s more and more with Israel as a straightforward military and, and strategic ally in amid that uh, war on terror. So how does not worrying too much about civilians and Dahia uh, doctrine figure into all of this? What is that? Yeah, the Dahiya Doctrine is named for uh, basically a Beirut suburb, heavily occupied, um, populated by Shiite Muslims. And of course, in the first uh, invasion, there'd been uh, the notorious uh, Sabra and Shatila massacres in uh, greater Beirut. But the, the viciousness and the violence in Lebanon in, in all the interventions, there's another major intervention in 1996, in, in Lebanon. Um, there's been a, a, a notable disdain and certainly in the Gaza wars that we can talk about as well for um, uh, collateral damage for civilian populations. Um, the wars have been very indiscriminate and the use. And so the Dahia doctrine was basically a pronouncement by the Israeli military that they just won't bother to make any distinctions between civilian and military targets, uh, that uh, everybody's a legitimate target. And so masses of you know, elderly people, women, children, non-combatants are, are killed in these uh, airstrikes and artillery barrages that are unleashed. And Israel is basically unapologetic and uh, and says that it will uh, continue this approach. So really it becomes ensconced in military doctrine by this dominant military power in, in the region. And Israel is by far the dominant military power in the Middle East. So it seems as though APAC got the job done. You have the Bush administration uh, fighting off calls at the UN, uh, even from the EU and world leaders to have a ceasefire and Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State saying, well, this is no time for a ceasefire. 
And so the US, at kind of the height of the onslaught for 34 days, enables Israel to, to continue pounding away. And most Americans kind of swallowed APAC's depiction of Israel as being a besieged innocent under terrorist attack, as, as you write. Um, so APAC's uh, job in Congress uh, was to do what? And what sort of results was it getting in Congress to support this attack? <clears throat> well, um, you're right about, about those, those perceptions of um, APAC successfully, uh, particularly in the period after 9-11. What 9-11 did was it made a lot of Americans identify with this narrative of Israel as the besieged innocent. A lot of Americans perceived the United States as the besieged innocent in 9-11. And of course, innocent people were killed in 9-11, but the United States was hardly innocent. Uh, there were reasons why the United States was targeted and it had uh, unleashed its own indiscriminate violence um, in many places, which uh, really um, created the um, militant Islamic resistance that uh, finally unleashed 9-11 and, and grew in so many other countries. But what 9-11 did was made a lot of Americans identify with Israel. This is what Israel had long claimed to be, a besieged innocent surrounded by hostile forces who would destroy it if they possibly could. And by these, these uh, you know, horrifying attacks in the United States and in, in Washington and New York and Pennsylvania, Americans could more and more relate to this special ally that Kennedy had proclaimed Israel to be in the early 1960s, and APAC had nurtured for decades. So um, amid the war on terror, there's this natural sort of affinity, but at the same time, um, there is some effort, even by a very pro-Israeli president like George W. Bush, to rein in the excesses of Israeli uh, aggression. But whatever that sort of criticism occurred, or there was any effort to link the massive American funding, which we really haven't talked about, of course, is the essence of what the lobby does, is secures mm -hmm. for Israel massive American funding right. to the tune of $150 billion since World War II, far more than any other country in the world has received, this tiny little country of about 9 million people, which is the powerhouse militarily in the Middle East, doesn't need all this American money which could well go uh, much more uh, effectively to benefit other people in other countries, if not just in the United States itself. Mm -hmm. But in any case, whenever there's any hint of linking Israeli aggression, brutal violence in Lebanon or Gaza with its behavior or something else we haven't discussed, Israel's utter disdain for the so-called peace process, another uh, fantastic propaganda a uh, story for APAC is that Israel has, oh, long sought peace, but has not been able to get the Palestinians to cooperate. It's just utter nonsense. And the, the reverse is true. And this has really been established by scholarship at this point, that it's not even questionable that Israel has resolutely opposed the peace process and a settlement that might drive it out of the occupied territory. But to finish this uh, thread, whenever the, the effort has been made to criticize Israeli aggression or excess militarism or link, much less link US funding, this happened to George W. Bush, a massive, as it happened to his father, a massive rally was called in Washington. Uh, the Jewish organizations, uh, Elie Wiesel spoke, others spoke, claimed that Israel was threatened, its very existence was under threat. The United States had to stand by Israel. The cliche of cliches that it was threatened to be driven into the sea, which is complete nonsense. Uh, so these rallies would be held, the congressmen would be called, emailed. Um, let, APAC continually let them know that they would receive support from the lobby or their opponent would receive support, support from the lobby, depending on their reaction. So they would, they would mobilize very effectively to rein in the criticism. So APAC and the lobby have done this again and again and again over the decades, policed the discourse uh, 
in Washington and that permeates throughout the country. So within this time period we're focusing on uh, in the chapter, APAC and commands, you have Israel having taken control of Gaza in 1967 um, and Ariel Sharon orchestrating you know, the expulsion of thousands of Gaza Palestinians, destroying their homes, and then attempting it to settle portions of it. You have this um, sort of turnaround in 2005 when the same Ariel Sharon decides to dismantle the settlements and disengage from Gaza, just presented as this tremendous uh, sort of um acquiescence this incredible gesture what was going on in this particular time period and what did it have to do with the uh oslo peace process and so-called roadmap right well the so-called peace process um went back uh really to jimmy carter and uh, his effort to, which had its limitations, but was uh, sincere in some respects as well. Um, the, the scholarship is really coming out on, on Carter now, and it's a, it's a mixed uh, bag, but um, achieved, and Sadat of Egypt achieved uh, peace with Israel on Egypt's terms of getting back the Sinai. So that's the beginning of dealing with the occupied territories. But the determination of Begin and uh, a consensus of Israelis, even those who criticize the country, don't do it enough to force the return of the occupied territories, which are Ill illegally held and have been since 1967. So as you well know, settlement of the West Bank uh, really proliferated, especially in the Reagan 80s. Reagan enabled Israel to get away with settlement the first Bush tried to rein it in some, he failed. And so um, they're not gonna relinquish the West Bank. This is the greater Israel, the biblical Israel. But Gaza is a problem because it is so densely populated with uh, Palestinians. And so Sharon makes the determination that Gaza is a cancer and they can uh, let it go. But never do they give full independence to Gaza. And that was immediately clear when the Palestinians, when Hamas won an, uh, a free election that was uh, internationally monitored and perfectly free, but the bad guys won mm -hmm. as far as the Americans and the Israelis were concerned. And so Gaza was blockaded, its access controlled, its resources controlled, its economy controlled. It was never given its independence in any meaningful way. But moreover, and back to your question about this time period in the aftermath of Lebanon, Israel looked for, and Sharon, who is, a, is essentially a war criminal, uh, Avi Shlaim called him a little more nicely a Jewish Rambo, but uh, clearly an aggressive uh, person, and going back to the militarist, and going back to the Kibya massacre, which he orchestrated in Jordan in 1953, um, is had no compu uh, compulsion, compunctions. He's had compulsions for sure about killing uh, Arabs and Palestinians. He, in fact, gloried in it. And so they were looking to unleash violence against Gaza to sort of cover up the failure in Lebanon. Um, it's sort of analogous to the United States in the Persian Gulf War in 1991, exulting in victory after uh, the defeat in Vietnam. We'll see what happens now that the United States has been driven out of Afghanistan. Right. But in any case, they look for an excuse and an opportunity, which is easy to find, to unleash uh, Israeli militarism on Gaza and to just pummel it indiscriminately, uh, killing and injuring masses of people in um, cast lead and other uh, operations again in 2014. And again, here more recently, Gaza has been uh, horribly victimized, uh, just a human rights nightmare uh, by this aggressive militarist Israeli state. It's really unforgivable uh, violence that has been unleashed against a captive people.
So ironically, or maybe not so unexpectedly, you write that Israel was on uh, APAC were able to cash in on this magnanimous gesture of withdrawing from Gaza. They get an additional $2 billion in US aid um, to uh, relocate their military facilities and all the settlers. Somehow all this expense falls on US taxpayers. Um, so it's, it's interesting how there's always uh, this sort of uh, obligation the US has to cover the costs of all of these things. But you mentioned um, the Operation Cast Lead. And one of the interesting uh, little descriptions you have uh, about accountability and fledgling accountability is the case of Richard Goldstone. Uh, who was Richard Goldstone? What did he do and, and what happened to him? Well, he, he was um, a South African jurist, uh, a very uh, acclaimed uh, attorney and, and judge uh, who was uh, a Zionist, uh, whose daughter uh, went to Hebrew University. And uh, so not anti-Israel by any stretch, uh, but you know, um, for a time at least, uh, a legitimate and, and uh, honest and um, straightforward um, jurist who would follow the evidence. And uh, he uh, directed the investigation of Operation Cast Lead and uh, concluded, because the facts showed uh, un unequivocally, and, and um, books by Finkelstein and others have made this very clear, what happened in Gaza, uh, very close reading of the uh, human rights reports. But Goldstone um, gave the formal evaluation of the assault and uh, said that it had been indiscriminate and unnecessary violence had been unleashed and Israel was responsible for that. He was immediately demonized, vilified, brutally attacked, um, and he backtracked and ultimately caved in uh, to this, uh, the other jurists who sat on this um, UN-backed assessment um, concluded that the report had been accurate and, and would not back off on it. But Goldstone, under enormous pressure from APAC uh, and uh, from fellow uh, Israelis, um, backed off and uh, revised his report accordingly. This has even happened some, as Finkelstein has shown, with human rights groups. Uh, that under Israeli a barrage of APAC and Israeli criticism have, have uh, tempered their reports, um, really distorting the facts away from where they lead you. And that is that the violence was often uh, indiscriminate and targeted civilians rather than combatants. So the whole problem goes away um, you mentioned another really interesting bit of infrastructure building where we have the, again, at that time, ubiquitous Sheldon Adelson and his millions and millions from his gambling empire stepping forward to help out in infrastructure building. How, in what key way did uh, Sheldon Adelson help APAC expand at this particular point in time? Well, let's go back to your comment about the United States funding things as well. Um, sure. This is an incredible story throughout the history of the lobby, how tremendously effective Israel is at cashing in on its own aggression um, or on any effort by the United States to aid other Arab countries. So from the beginning, the State Department, which we really haven't discussed and probably should have, and Israel's armor focuses a lot on the battle between the State Department and the emergence of the lobby. Yes. American diplomats knew that the U.S. policy toward the Middle East was imbalanced in Israel's favor, and they wanted to support people like King Hussein and, of course, Saudi Arabia for all its oil for decades that the Americans were addicted to and had to really um, push and fight to get through the lobby to get any support. So, for example, when the United States would want to sell modest you know, planes or tanks to Jordan, the lobby would, would put up a huge fight 
And the way this typically played out was Jordan got a few weapons and Israel got about 10 times that much in order to quiet down the lobby. So this is how they got phantom jets and, and all sorts of other uh, weapons over the years from the Americans by um, responding to any effort to aid Arab allies. Now you ask about Adelson. So in addition to all the funding that the American government um, gives to Israel, the flip side of that is the, you know, the big money, the huge amount of money that a, a casino mogul like Adelson had uh, and his wife now has uh, to give to, to Israel and uh, to give to uh, far right supporters of Israel, notably Donald Trump that Adelson aided with uh, tens of millions of dollars in his campaigns. So this money makes a big difference. It's pumped into the lobby. In more recent times, it's gone into campaigns to silence criticism on college campuses, to attack freedom of speech, to engage in uh, lawfare with frivolous uh, lawsuits or patently um, unconstitutional anti-free speech measures, efforts to equate uh, freedom criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, which is one of the most odious and now widespread practices of the lobby. So Adelson's money has gone into all of that and plays a big role in how this, this whole uh, aspect of uh, recent history especially has unfolded. Sure. Yeah, the the building of their new headquarters on H Street, which if anyone has a chance to go and take a look at it, it's very strategically located, the steps away from Congress, which is the most important uh, target of their efforts. And, you know, can you can't under underestimate probably how much more important it is than even the much more distant Israeli embassy. Um, so, well, it's it's an expansive, uh, as you well know, highly expansive entity, the lobby, and not only expanding those physical facilities dramatically, but doubling mm -hmm. or tripling the number of personnel in recent years, yeah. expanding as you've chronicled into state governments. So there are the proverbial many tentacles of the lobby. And it's extremely well-funded and sort of uh, reminds me of what George Kennan said about the expansion of communism. It's like a fluid stream that will go into any available nook and cranny where it thinks it can be effective. And so that's what the lobby does. If it sees an opportunity and it's building more and more people and facilities to to engage in it. What's, what's gonna be interesting, and we can discuss more if you wish, is to see whether they revive their annual conference or if they are, are starting to shift, which I kind of suspect to try to do this all a little more quietly and yeah. leave it to just a few of us who are willing to talk about it to, to publicize what they actually do. Well, I think that is an interesting point to end on and, and we definitely should go into that. I, I do see major strategic shifts in how they're operating and they are uh, facing a new environment. Um, but let's get into one of the probably most successful programs that they've had for decades and decades and decades. Isaiah Kennan himself, uh, back in the early days, founder of APAC, flew to Israel, received uh, members of Congress arranged what looked like spontaneous encounters with Americans who were making a pilgrimage to live in Israel and couldn't talk enough about the importance of getting American representatives over to Israel to experience uh, kind of a propaganda trip and uh, you know, even reward them for having passed millions and millions in aid. So the, the junket to Israel has been an extremely important part of the lobby's activities. And, and you do write about that in the book. Why is uh, Israel the destination for one in three congressional trips overseas that are sponsored by private entities. Why, why do you think that getting them over there is so important? 
Well, yes, it, uh, it, it turns out our elected representatives can't turn down that free $10,000 uh, trip to the Middle East that they get uh, gratis of the Israel lobby. And they, they skirt laws that are intended to limit that kind of, of influence. Um, it proved to be very effective. And, um, you know, it can be very emotional experience for people going to the, you know, Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's a transformative experience for many people to go spend time there. And this has been true of, of some of the congressmen. But moreover, you're, um, you know, provided this trip and then provided a steady stream of pro-Israeli discourse reiterating the main themes that Israel's the sole democracy of the region, which is of course a myth. You can't repress 20% of your own population and illegally occupy neighboring territories in an apartheid setting and call yourself a democracy. But they do that, of course. And so the, the trips where you, know, you go, you enjoy the country, you have a good time, you have an emotional uh, connection with the Holy Land, you're told constantly throughout it that Israel just wants to live and let live and is besieged by maddened, crazy Arab suicide bombers, et cetera. Uh, so for uh, many of our elected representatives, they're not always, frankly, the sharpest knives in the drawer to start with. Uh, they're highly susceptible to this. It's been very effective. And they, they um, you know, as some have said, I came home a Zionist. Mm -hmm. It's really been a transformative for many of them. So it, it proved highly effective and Israel invests very heavily in that, uh, especially with Congress, but also with high school students, college students. There are many programs of, uh, in which they fund with Adelson's and others millions, uh, taking uh, Americans to the Holy Land to uh, exposing them to the propaganda barrage right. and effectively winning them over. So, so yeah, you know, allegedly these trips are funded by an entirely separate organization. It's the American Israel Education Foundation, which is really just kind of a piece of paper in the drawer of APAC with no employees, no really separate infrastructure. And it really, this is not unknown by anybody. Uh, everyone knows it's, it's kind of a shell. Uh, any member of Congress flying to Israel is surrounded on the plane by operatives who are pushing talking points the whole way. And it's, of course, not a trip to the Middle East. It's a carefully crafted trip to Israel and sometimes part of the occupied territories for a little show Potemkin village type visit to key projects that APAC wants them to see. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's highly, highly effective in getting uh, sort of this allegiance built up. The other thing that we found uh, in just asking uh, your average voter in the United States what they make of all this, in 2019, uh, when a large contingent of House Democrats were visiting Israel during their congressional resource, or excuse me, recess, uh, we asked uh, whether they should be doing that or visiting their districts and 65.7% of respondents in a statistically significant poll said they should be in their districts. They shouldn't just make themselves unavailable uh, during, uh, you know, during these key times when they're supposed to be uh, meeting with their constituents. So it's got a lot of aspects to it, which again, in the wake of the Jack Abramoff scandal, uh, there was, as you mentioned, an attempt to outlaw industry enabled junkets of that sort. And there's something called the APAC loophole, which is common across many laws, regulations and norms, which says, well, APAC doesn't actually have to follow that. So another thing that's interesting is APAC's role in uh, sponsoring legislation and getting it through Congress. You mentioned Brian Baird, who talked about something he termed the swing, which is, you know, if APAC is communicating to the donor network, and in this country, Blackboard and other major nonprofit software companies talk about the huge 
correlation between people who donate to charity and people who donate to political campaigns to kind of see them as both avenues for creating change. But APAC has, as you mentioned, these giant donor bases. And uh, Brian Baird talked about the swing. If you're towing the APAC line, you get the $200,000. And if you don't, your opponent's going to get the 200,000 and you're going to get nothing. He tells it a $400,000 swing. So how does this impact legislation? How does this impact APAC's ability to get their program through Congress? Well, obviously it's crucial to their ability to dominate the Congress. If you can threaten their job, which, uh, you know, Brian Baird and others have, have pointed out that absolutely is the case. Um, I thought it highly revealing, um, the story of Mitch McConnell. Uh, he narrowly, barely won his first Kentucky Senate race, and the lobby had supported the incumbent, a Democrat named uh, Walter D. Huddleston. McConnell won, and he basically went directly to APAC, and he said, look, fellas, what do I have to do next time to get your support? You almost cost me this election. Mm -hmm. And they said, sure, Mitch, uh, we'll be happy to support Republicans, tow the Israel line. And Mitch said, you got it. And so um, he gets the money, he gets the support, uh, his Democratic opponents don't, and he's become one of the longest uh, reigning and uh, most successful power brokers in the history of the Congress. So um, APEC has, has played this role again and again, going back to the targeting of, of Charles Percy, a uh, Republican who chaired the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee and criticized the assault in Lebanon. He was targeted and defeated uh, there have been many other cases where that's happened. On the other hand, uh, where, you know, where the swing is crucial, the money that you get or don't get and your opponent gets if you don't tow the Israel line. On the other hand, uh, and incur on the encouraging side, and we take encouragement wherever we can with this subject, in more recent times, uh, Israel has thrown the money in the lobby behind uh, candidates uh, who have a strong pro-Israeli record, and yet uh, they have uh, not always won. They've suffered a couple of key defeats in the most recent congressional elections, and they have targeted and been unable to oust people like Ilhan Omar and uh, Regina Tlaib and um, Betty McCollum and others. So uh, there are lasting critics who can fight this off, fend this off, and um, even all the money uh, hasn't resulted in, um, in Israel having its way uh, totally throughout the Congress. So there are chinks in the armor, yet the story overall is one of, of uh, an amazing domination of the United States Congress. And if it were done by any other country, let alone you know, Russia or China, imagine if more than half the Congress was taking junkets to China paid for by the Chinese government, what mm -hmm. the American public would have to say about that. Whereas you, as you noted, with Israel, it goes unchallenged, even though it's it's skirting laws meant to prevent that very thing. Um, so overall, it's been a story of of uh, really shameless domination and it's a disgraceful story, really, in American history of a foreign country uh, dominating the U.S. Congress. But uh, there are there are some hopeful signs. Yeah, I, I think there are some hopeful signs, and I think you've exhausted the list in some of your final chapter analysis about what's been going on. Unfortunately, most recently after the book was published, you have the case of Chantel Brown um, and Nina Turner in Ohio, where Democratic majority for Israel, this new uh, dark money front to shovel money into key elections that didn't prevail in the Jamal Bowman race, uh, did prevail, it seems, uh, in your state. <laughs> and right. I imagine you were watching- My that. district. Your district, okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's clear that if you drill down on the various polls that there no longer seems to be a democratic majority for Israel uh, in terms of the way uh, progressives within the party are, are feeling about the, uh, what the Israelis have been doing. Um, you know, how, how, how much, uh, how many uh, more races do you think we're going to see where 
they've managed to figure out the code and go against this groundswell of popular opinion to win the candidate uh, narrowly uh, that they want for office. Yeah, I think especially in off-year elections, um, the lobby can be, and, and these mainstream organizations can be more effective than you know, a lot of people don't turn out to vote. Um, so a, a majority of Democrats more and more are, are willing to, um, there, is a, there is a gulf between the base and the uh, centrist domination of the party, which uh, Biden and Nancy Pelosi continue to anchor. Uh, so there was another 12 day onslaught in mm -hmm. uh, Gaza and Biden said not a word of criticism of uh, of Israeli excesses. And uh, once again, you, you mentioned Condoleezza Rice's quote earlier, Biden said the same thing, you know, Israel's got a right to defend itself. And here it is unleashing this indiscriminate violence, just pulverizing a, a captive people in, in Gaza. So right. to some extent, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And yet, you know, the things we've discussed here, the um, more and more willingness of, of more and more American liberal Jews to uh, at least, you know, can contemplate being critical of Israel, uh, more and more progressives uh, challenging the, the line. Um, it, uh, it's still a mixed bag. They're going to win some and lose some. And until the mainstream Democratic Party uh, has the integrity to weigh in on this issue, it'll probably continue to be, you know, deeply problematic. So you mentioned uh, another uh, change in the lobby, and that has been the inability of APAC to have their traditional policy conference, or at least that's what they call it, in Washington now for two years running. They canceled uh, 2021. They canceled, they're going to cancel 2022. Um, APAC counts on and spends quite a significant portion of its hundred million dollar per year budget on uh, calling together activists through the Jewish federations in every state, through related organizations to come to Washington where uh, American politicians, elected officials are uh, put through uh, the uh, process of, you know, appearing and mouthing some words uh, before these massive audiences, having these breakout sessions, and they can't do it. They can't meet. It's, uh, you know, they've said it's because of COVID-19 and, and other issues, although other groups uh, like J Street seems like they're going to be meeting in 2022. Uh, if these citizen lobbyists can't appear and get their talking points and march up to Capitol Hill to lobby their members of Congress, does that, in your view, represent a major blow to the APAC program that's been in place for decades and decades? Well, um, you know, as we've discussed, you know, I'm a historian and, and look at the history of this this um, issue and of the lobby itself. Um, I don't know that I have my finger on right where they are today, but I have my suspicions about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be more interested in your thoughts on, on this. But if you look back, for example, at the George H.W. Bush vignette, when he uh, was determined after the Persian Gulf War to try to achieve a, a real comprehensive Middle East peace, and Israel was stonewalling negotiations. And the lobby called out a big demonstration in Washington against Bush's efforts to pressure Israel. And he uh, flipped the discourse pretty effectively by saying, hey, I'm just one lonely guy being besieged by hundreds of lobbyists here. Thank you. Back on the question of the Israeli loan guarantees, even many of your Republican supporters on the Hill say that Israel should have had this money a long time ago, and they don't support the 120-day 
uh, delay that you're asking for. Is there any kind of compromise? Is there any kind of middle ground? You sound very tough today on wanting to hold to that 100. I just sound principled. I want. I, I'm convinced that the uh, that this debate this debate would be counterproductive to peace, and I owe it to the members of Congress to say it as forcefully as I can. I've worn out the telephone in there in one ear, and I'm going to move over to the other ear and keep on it because this is peace is peace is vital here, and we've worked too hard uh, to have that request of mine denied. And I think the American people will support me. They know we support Israel. Uh, they, uh, they, I've just detailed some of what we've done. So there should be no question about that. I am giving the Congress, and I did it with the leaders today, having an opportunity here, thank you, to do it here, uh, to give my best judgment. And uh, I'm up against some powerful political forces, but I owe it to the American people to tell them how strongly I feel about deferral. Are those powerful political forces ungrateful for what you've done so far on a peace process, and why doesn't the peace argument sell with them? I think it will sell, but it's taken a little time, and we're up against a very strong and effective, sometimes, uh, groups that go up to the hill. I was heard today there were something like a thousand lobbyists on the hill working the other side of the question. We got one lonely little guy down here doing it. So, uh, so, uh, however, I like this forum better, too. I don't know. I'm not talking about gratitude. I'm talking about world peace. And we got to get it into a far broader perspective. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I think people will understand that. Yes, Jim. And he won a short skirmish and forced uh, Israel to formally take part in the Madrid conference, which they just continued to stonewall. And uh, soon enough, uh, they triumphed ultimately. And Bush was a one-term president that they targeted and defeated, helped defeat uh, in his re-election bid. But I do sometimes wonder if they are wondering if their hand appears too heavy, mm -hmm. especially with this growing number of people criticizing the lobby. I'm wondering if they think they might be more effective by not having this mass gathering where they sort of put it in everybody's face and are, are out front with their overwhelming power with these politicians one after another just, uh, you know, uh, going head bowed before the Israel lobby and uh, yeah. just stating all of their talking points blatantly and Right. Um, I'm not sure they're, they've concluded that, that it might not be better to use their massive resources more quietly right. by uh, uh, undermining, uh, by attacking people as anti-Semitic, by right. engaging in lawfare, by engaging in really terrible practices like Canary Mission, where they imagine, you know, damaging for life the reputations of students for... Uh, legitimate defense of injustice in Palestine. This is the sort of nasty stuff they do. Right. And so I think they may be deciding that it may be better to use their money quietly as they do in state government, as you've chronicled, uh, try to use it more effectively, more quietly. But I'm not sure about that. It may just be COVID. And once it's all over, they'll be back in a big way. So we'll see. No, I think you're spot on that the optics of all these politicians genuflicting to APAC while at the same time there's a massive protest right outside the doors, not to mention a counter conference that's been held ever since 2015 at the National Press Club, you know, having major speakers <laughs> talking about the amount of damage the APAC program does to the US. I think all of that is adding up. Um, but unfortunately, in their last rounds, uh, they said, well, don't worry that we're not meeting in Washington. We are meeting for coffee. And so instead of heading into the congressional offices, they are effectively able to get what few other organized groups without their resources can get, which are Zoom meetings, not with the aid of the senator or congressperson, but directly with the congressperson and senator with the group from their state that would have come into their office uh, via the APAC lobbying conference. So uh, I think that is worrisome. And I think it is uh, probably even uh, more attuned to the times. Maybe they would have done that even without COVID. So I guess we have to keep track of it. So uh, in kind of wrapping up here, uh, I think it's 
uh, important to mention that print copy of Architects of Repression uh, is available at Middle East Books and More, uh, the preferred place to buy that. Um, for academics looking to assign a beautiful hardcover version of the book, that'll be upcoming and available through the Ingram network that you can buy in bulk. You can also get the audiobook, which is an excellent way to listen to Architects of Repression, narrated by Walter himself uh, at audible.com. You can get the Kindle version uh, and the paperback at amazon.com. So there are myriad ways of getting your copy of this excellent, excellent book, which, you know, fully full, footnoted, indexed absolutely uh, incredible amount of research that went into this book. And again, tapping new source material, new primary research. Uh, how else can people follow your work, Walter? WalterHickson.com is about it, but... Um... <laughs> WalterHickson.com. And, you know, Walter is also appearing pretty frequently uh, at uh, events and podcasts um in our israel lobby con series so he's spoken at two conferences and if we could maybe mention um the one the one i think is the best is is the last one when you know it's partly the title um of you know what everyone needs to know and that that 25 or 30 minute one so if yeah okay so youtube videos and We'll put uh, some link to videos, especially the uh, lobby. What everyone wants to know is a distillation of the book. But so we'll we'll put in some links at the bottom, where you can get his best talks, most recent talks, and everything uh, you need to follow some of his upcoming.